And anybody who has a mother, you're welcome today. Okay, so I, I, I need you guys to do something for me as we start service. So uh, a few weeks ago at Easter, we videotaped a short greeting to our friend Ken and Katie who helped us start this church. And Ken had, uh, he had to have surgery on his knee. So he's kind of, he's uh, in quarantine at home and he would love to be here. And so, and then Katie obviously is a mother. We want her to feel welcome, but I also want to harass Ken and wish him a happy Mother's Day. <laughs> so can we do that? Can we please, I'll just we'll say, Happy Mother's Day, Ken and Katie, we love you. Can we do that? I'm gonna get in this video this time. Oh, wait. I'm a little tech not so good. There we go. Are you guys ready? On three, one, two, three. Ken and Katie. We're trying to personalize this here, guys. Okay, thank you very much. I'll make sure he gets it. He will be very happy. Well, welcome, mothers and everybody else. Uh, you know, life, in a way, is really not that complicated. If we do what God wants us to do, things will go well. If we don't do what God wants us to do, there's going to be trouble. So I think today things are going to go very well because we're going to do our best to honor mothers. And that's according to God's will. He said in the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Now he did say father and mother, but our custom to honor women, we allow ladies to go first. So fathers, you'll have another day to honor you, but today it's the mothers. Now, if you um, are a mother or to be, uh, well, actually, we're just gonna cheer. Everybody's gonna cheer because everybody has a mom. That's one thing. You may not be a mom, but everybody has a mom. And so we wanna acknowledge our moms by a cheer. Now, I want you to think about this. Um, so when my team does well, when an athlete makes a great play, I cheer, man, I'm shouting. The neighborhood knows it. But that's nothing compared to a woman bearing a child for nine months and going through whatever they gotta go through to get that baby out. That's worth cheering about, don't you think? Because otherwise we would not be here. So on three, we'll cheer. Everybody's gonna cheer their mom. Ready, one, two, three. Yeah! Okay, so it's, it's right that we should honor moms because God told us to, but also, in many ways, moms are like God, and so uh, we're going to look at how they bless us, and we're going to look at how they do it. But first, uh, women have an absolute great privilege. They get to bear children and give life. That is a unique gift to women, and only to women, and so we want to celebrate and honor that today. However... It's important to note that all women are of great value, all women, for the simple fact that they are made in God's image. It has, uh, so if you can't have children, you're just as valuable as one who can because uh, your value is in the fact that you're a child of God made in His image. So this is not to in any way diminish somebody who may not be able to have children. And yet we want to honor those who can and I think it's also important to note that the physical and biological ability to produce a child doesn't make you a mom and so a mom who can't bear children could be a, as good or better mom than one who can amen, amen? okay so we're one of moms we want to honor you for the ways that you're like God and the first way you're like God is that you sacrifice for us now my wife and I have two children uh, and one is strong-willed and it wasn't the first one so the first one was the easiest baby in the world to take care of. He would sit in his high chair for hours and eat. And quite honestly, we came to the natural conclusion that we were the best parents ever. We couldn't deny it. It was just a fact looking us in the face. Our child was so well behaved, we had to be excellent parents. And then we had our second child. And God showed us how wrong we were. I don't know if you have a strong-willed child or if you were a strong-willed child, but basically it looks like this. They think they are the boss. 
They don't ask permission. They tell you what they're going to do. And where did this come from? I mean, there's just a little kid, and they're just, they think they run the show. Now, having a strong-willed child is no easy task. You know, it, you have to learn how to be a parent. And we were just so naturally good with this easy child that when this difficult child came, we didn't know what to do. <laughs> Honestly, and, and we had to study, and that child needed direction. Um, that spirit that they have is wonderful. You don't want to destroy it, but you do need to direct it. And our strong-willed child has turned out great. And most of the credit for that goes to me. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you why. Because my wife did all the study and stuff, and I didn't get in her way. I didn't try to stop her when she tried to <laughs> discipline our daughter. And so, you know, I mean, that was my natural inclination. Now, I love... I love all my children. I love them equally. Now I have four of them. Um, but I have a soft spot for my daughter. I'll admit that. Uh, a dad for the darling got one daughter. And man, she was a cute little demon, you know? I, <laughs> it was hard to get mad at her. But her mother, her mother did, was, th that was just, it was not going to fly in our house. All right, it was a battle of wills. That's what it was. It was our, our daughter who thought she was in charge and us. And I probably would have caved into that cute little thing. But my wife took a stand. Nope. And she, we disciplined her and I followed along. I participated. And it, it had a, a, a great effect. Now, our kids obviously were not perfect parents. Our kids aren't perfect children. Um, but because of their mother's investment, that strong-willed child is now about to be a mother of her own. And uh, I hope she gets a strong-willed child. Yeah, thank you. She, she didn't mean to be difficult. It's just the way she was. But uh, she'll see what it's like, hopefully. So my wife was willing to sacrifice, right? It, it would have been easy to just let it go in a way, right? Easier, and then we'd probably have to deal with it down the line. But she was willing to sacrifice and win that battle of wills. And mothers innately are willing to sacrifice for their children. So Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, other than Jesus, um, he, in fact, his wisdom was famous throughout the world. People would come to see him because they knew how wise he was. And one of the stories that established his wisdom was one day he's holding court in his um, palace and two ladies of the evening come to see him. They live together in the same house. And they bring two babies. Each one of them has a baby, except one baby is dead and one's alive. And the one with the dead baby points to the other one with the live baby and says, Solomon, that's my baby. The night before, she was sleeping with her baby and she rolled over on him and, and smothered him and killed him. And while I was asleep, the next night she came and switched babies and she gave me the dead baby and she took my live baby. And the other woman said, that's not true. This live baby is my baby. And they're going back and forth right in front of King Solomon. No, it's you. No, it's you. And finally, Solomon says, bring me a sword. Cut the live baby in half. Give one half to this mother, one half to that mother. That'll settle it. And one mother, the one with the dead baby, said, no, don't. Don't, don't cut that baby in half. Let that woman have it. Solomon said, okay, give the live baby to that woman. She's the mother. So the wisest man in the world knew that the true mother would not allow their baby to be killed, even if it meant sacrificing that child and let her enemy have it and raise it. So even a woman of poor character, a prostitute, is willing to sacrifice for her child. It's it's innate in women. God put it there. Now God does the same thing. He sacrificed his son for us. He gave his son up for our good. He didn't want to. He loved his son. But he loved us. And to give up his son, he could gain us. Now without Jesus, we have no hope. John 1 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Our life, uh, Mothers are willing to sacrifice their own benefit for our behalf, for our good, and God does the same. In that way, they're just like God. So that's what a, a not very well-developed woman will do to sacrifice for a child. But what does mature motherhood look like? 
Well, in Proverbs 31, it describes a godly woman, the whole chapter, but we'll just read a few of the last verses, starting from verse 25. It says, Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She doesn't fear the future. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So the second way we see that moms are like God is moms ideally lead us to Jesus. Now I'll show you a picture of a man. Gold star, if anybody knows who that is. Colin, you don't get to say anything. He got it right. Yeah. How do you know that? Say it louder. John Wesley. It is John Wesley. You may or may not know of John Wesley, but he was uh, born in England. And just after the turn of the century of 1700, when he went to Oxford in the 1720s, he be, uh, formed a group of other Christians and they were extremely disciplined in their Christian practices. Daily, they would read the Bible and pray and do good works. In fact, they were so disciplined in their methods that they nicknamed them Methodists as a, a, to tease them, but instead they liked that name and they kept it and it eventually led to the Methodist movement. This is a quote of John Wesley's. You may have heard it. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. He thought that's the essence of Christianity, and he practiced it, and they pushed for social reforms, and he was instrumental in the ending of the, the practice of slavery, in England, he was a good friend and a mentor to William Wilberforce, who was the driving force for the ending of slavery in England. So he had a huge impact. In fact, his impact is still felt today. The Methodist Church is still with us. There's millions of them. Now, John Wesley, it's not hyperbole to say that he changed the world. But John Wesley was changed by his mother. Her name was Susanna Wesley. She was the last of 25 children. Her dad was a preacher and an editor, so her home was filled with books. It was also filled with conversations about Christianity, and she heard all this and read all this, and she was an extremely intelligent lady. When she was 19, she married a preacher, and they had 19 children, 10 of whom made it to adulthood. She made it her mission to educate her children, including her girls, which was unusual at that time. So when her children, from the time they were very young, she taught them that there is a supreme being that you owe your gratitude and allegiance to, and you should honor and reverence him. Even before they could walk or talk, she taught them a sign to bless their food, probably the sign of the cross. She started from the very beginning. They were taught to pray the Our Father before they went to bed and when they woke up. She was their teacher. She was the one who educated them. It started at when they were five. They began each day and closed each day by singing a psalm and reading the Bible. She required six hours of study, three hours in the morning and three in the afternoon, six days a week. She worked it out so that she got to spend one hour with each child individually each week to teach them about God. She made a point to teach her children to treat everybody with courtesy, even their siblings and the servants in the house. She wanted to teach them how to think, not what to think. That's what our schools are supposed to do, not tell us what to think, teach us how to think. I hope that's what happens on Sunday morning, that you are learning, we are learning how to think Christianly and not just what to think. I don't want to indoctrinate anybody. I want you to come to your own conclusions. The right one, the one I say is the right one. <laughs> the one God says. Now, she changed the world by what? By being a mother. 
by investing in her child and living that life herself. Now, my own mother has been and is a believer. I was raised going to church. Nevertheless, I went astray very far, far, far astray. But when God eventually got a hold of me and drew me back, I had something to go back to. The first thing I did, I remember the night, the night I cried out to God, and I didn't really even believe in God at that time. I did what, all I knew. I knew the Our Father. I taught that, was taught that as a child. Every night I used to pray it, just like John Wesley's mom. I was taught to pray the Our Father before I went to sleep, to kneel down at the bed and do it. Well, as an adult, well, as a teenager, not quite, I thought I was an adult, but not quite. And I didn't know what else to do. I prayed the Our Father. Where did that come from? I was taught that as a child through my parents. Proverbs also says, teach a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. So moms, the greatest thing that you can do is to raise your children is to live a life obedient to God. They will see that, they will know that, and it will lead them to Jesus themselves. Amen? You have a great privilege to be a mother, and I hope we live in a culture that is trying, there's a vocal part of our culture that wants to destroy that, that wants to undermine that, and say it doesn't have value. But it does, because God says it does. And so mothers, we honor you for being mothers. Thank you, thank you for taking the time. There are no perfect mothers, just like there are no perfect children, but thank you. We honor you for what you've done. Amen, let's, let's pray together for our mothers. Dear Lord, thank you so much. You invented mothers. And we're so grateful that you did. Father, what a privilege that they get to spend those nine months. That child becomes part of them. And then they, life begins then, Father. The real work begins then by investing in them and teaching them. Thank you for the mothers, Father. Would you bless them for the sacrifices they've made on our behalf? Father, may their fruit be obedient, loving children. But Father, even you, the greatest parent ever, had rebellious children. So comfort those whose children may have gone astray, Father. May they continue to pray for them and know that you love them even more, their children, even more than they do, and want their return more than them. Thank you, Father. Help us to love and appreciate our mothers and not to take them for granted. Today especially, but every day, may we honor them according to your commandment and for your glory and for our own good. For all this, Father, we thank and praise you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.